Okay, welcome everyone to part two of our multi-part series on behavioral change techniques deployed during the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, before I forget, make sure that you subscribe, that you like our videos, and that you share our channel. This is the Manipulation Check, and we depend on your support uh, and on your advertising. So please pass us along. Now, in the last episode, we started working our way through an impactful paper published in the preeminent journal, Nature Human Behavior. And the title of the paper is Using Social and Behavioral Signs to Support COVID-19 Pandemic Response. And it was authored by Van Bavel and roughly 40 other uh, preeminent people in the field. And we talked about how uh, fear was being suggested to be used to motivate people into compliance with pandemic-related measures. And we also discussed uh, nudge as the overarching sort of category of techniques and also the philosophical underpinning, which is referred to as libertarian paternalism. And so if you uh, haven't seen the prior episode, make sure you go back to watch that episode first and then come back to this one. So today we want to talk about social norms and how they've been used to manipulate behavior during this COVID-19 pandemic. And so, Jeff, why don't you start us off on this topic? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Great intro. Um, still have lots to cover in this mm. article. So one of the next major sections in, the, in, this, in this article has to do with social norms and the, u- the use of social norms to manipulate behavior. So one of the things that's really powerful about this technique is that it can be used in any number, any number of ways. So we have a few examples, but before we get into that, I just want to, we'll go into a little bit of what the paper says about how social norms can get used to influence behavior. Good idea. So remember the premises for this article is that people are really bad, right? People can't understand things. They can't make their own decisions about risk. Uh, and they're really dangerous out there work walking around all by themselves, making their own decisions. So we need to help them. Uh, and we need to guide their behaviors because we can't just do normal things because if we don't, if we act like business as usual, then this virus is going to go crazy. Right. So we need to, yes. it says in the paper, slowing viral transmission during pandemics requires significant shifts in behavior. So that's yes. the whole point of all this stuff, right? We need to change people's behavior because if they were just to do what they would normally do, it's going to be bad. Mm-hmm. So social norms, they say people's behavior is influenced by social norms what they perceive others are doing and what they think that others approve or disapprove of. So that's generally what we're dealing with when we're talking about social norms, okay? Mm -hmm. However, there's an issue, right? The issue is people don't necessarily have accurate perceptions of norms. Ah, so they're not only bad at at knowing what to do about the pandemic, (laughs) they don't even know what the norms are. You can't even know, yeah, exactly. So you can't even trust people to know what the norms are. And what we're getting into is there's actually a couple of different kinds of norms that that's kind of like a one, two punch. We can pick up some slack. If one of the norms is lacking, there's another type of norm that can come along and save the day. Okay. Ooh, so that's good. The issue is that we got these potentially inaccurate perceptions of norms that may underestimate health promoting behaviors and then may overestimate unhealthy behaviors. So the goal is to correct and change these misperceptions, right? Mm -hmm. So how this can be achieved, the paper says this, this can be achieved by public messages reinforcing, for example, health promoting norms. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we need to get messages out there and say, okay, there's these norms for healthy behaviors. We need to promote these healthy behavior norms to correct these misperceptions that most people are actually engaging in these unhealthy ways. But what if, here's what it says, but if what most people are doing is not desirable, Providing purely descriptive normative information, so we're going to get some terminology here, can backfire by reducing positive behaviors among people who already engage in them, unless it is accompanied by information signaling that most people approve of these actions, prescriptive as opposed to descriptive norms. So here's where we get the two types of norms. We'll start with descriptive because I think that's the easiest one. I think that's what most people would think of. And that's how the paper kind of introduces it. It's basically what people are actually doing, what yeah. most people are typically doing. So the message would say most people have already received their vaccine. 
Exactly. 80% exactly. of the population has received the vaccine, and now it's 90% just yeah. in the span of a week. Exactly. So fact, fact, kind of fact-based, we can say, mm -hmm. what people are actually doing. That's descriptive. Okay, this is going to be on the test later. So we got descriptive, and then we got prescriptive. Okay. Also known as injunctive. But we're going to uh -huh. leave that term out because it's kind of a it's kind of a mouthful. But sometimes that gets used. The paper okay. doesn't talk about this explicitly. It kind of just assumes you, people are going to know this stuff. Prescriptive is basically like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Most people agree. Maybe even if not everybody's doing this, most people agree that this is the right thing to do. Okay. And so everybody agrees this is the right thing that should happen. Should and that's happen. why we should all enact it. And be motivated to make it happen, actually, to, to, to turn a prescriptive norm into a descriptive norm. <laughs> yeah, and kind of a classic one that, that's used to, de, to define or delineate what a prescriptive would be, prescriptive norm would be, would be something like giving blood. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, most people, not, many, not very many people do that, but most people are going to agree that that's a good thing to do, that you okay. should do that, right? Or brushing that's your right. teeth or something like that. Most yeah. people agree you should do it. Maybe not many people do it. Yeah, let yep. me just jump in here because uh, we should just let our, our listeners and viewers know that the Van Babel, the Van Babel, the Van Babel paper uh, isn't the only one suggesting that, that one should use norms. There were, mm -hmm. remember in the last episode, I mentioned a number of other papers that appeared early on that made suggestions about how to manipulate people's behavior during the pandemic. So a number of them actually mention norms. And one is a, is a paper by Volp and Lewinstein and uh, Butenheim. Volp, Lewinstein, and Butenheim. This was 2021. And the title of the paper is Behaviorally Informed Strategies for a National COVID-19 Vaccine Promotion Program. And it was published in JAMA. So that's a journal of the American Medical Association. The middle author there is George Lewinstein, who happens to be the Herbert A. Simon Professor of Economics and psychology at Carnegie Mellon University. He's one of the main players in this whole area of nudge and behavioral economics. Okay, so this is one of the one of the big guys, one of the big guns on this paper, and uh, they have a, a a section where they write about this use of norms. And here's a quick quote: People often take their cue of how to behave from the behavior of others and social accountability, how others view a person's actions could be an important motivator, end quote. So very similar kind of ideas. And there are other papers as well that maybe we'll touch on a little bit later on. Also interesting, Jeff, is the fact that in the Van Bavel et al. paper, they actually provide a specific example of a message that could be used to communicate social norms. And so yeah. this is what they their suggestion is, uh, quote, a message compelling social norms might say, quote, the overwhelming majority of people in your community believe that everyone should stay home. End quote. Um, something that really stands out to me, um, it, it's, and it stood out to me for a while, but especially nowadays, being more aware of some of this stuff, it's really, it's really sticking out to me, is when you'll see these news stories, and it's a news story, and it's a news story talking about polls, like poll mm -hmm. data. Those have always bothered me. Where it's kind of like, okay, you're reading like news events, current events, and then you get to this poll data. It's like, hey, guess what people think? <laughs> Here's what all these people think. Maybe it's a topic you're interested in, not inter interested in. And thinking like, is that, like, is that news? <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, hey, everybody thinks this. Guess what? Everybody, everybody thinks this is a good idea now. Um, so mm -hmm. here's, here's some examples. Um, that we just pulled from the headlines here over the past couple of years. This one here is from, where's this from? This one was uh, this is from Global News. Yeah, Global News. Coronavirus, one quarter of Canadians still not fully distancing, poll suggests. It's like, okay, mm. that's an interesting headline, right? It's normative data, but it's normative data that would almost go against the recommendations of this paper saying, you know what, most people aren't actually doing this desirable behavior. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting, right? So that would be the descriptive norm. This is what most people are doing. The first sentence of the article leads in with the prescriptive norm, though. So check this out. Canadians almost universally believe physical distancing will help slow the spread of the coronavirus pandemic. 
So people are, aren't doing this, but they should be doing this. And then later down in the article, um, actually, no, that's not this one. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. So then we can have another article here. Global news again, most of the world doesn't think social distancing will stop coronavirus. Ipsos poll says, so now we're getting mm. normative information, getting it. So universally Canadians would believe this. Now we go outside the world and the world doesn't think necessarily that uh, social distancing is going to stop the, stop the pandemic. So we're getting some normative information that would be descriptive. And then later on in this article, what we get is the prescriptive norms coming in. This uh, individual who's running this poll organization says these numbers are shockingly low um, and said one of the most universal surprising things about the poll was the lack of individual accountability people had for their potential role in spreading the virus. So we're getting these descriptive norms. People don't believe this internationally. And then you get the chastisement of the experts saying people should believe this. This is the right thing to believe. So Mm -hmm. we get the prescriptive norms in the form of this uh, form, this expert communication later on in the article. It seems like the prescriptive norms are filling in the gaps that are left empty by the descriptive norms. So if people are doing it, we're going to, we're going to praise them for it. That's a descriptive norm. If they're not doing it, then we're going to prescribe it. And that's the prescriptive norm. And so we just fill the, all the gaps now, and it's full bore ahead with, with whatever change we want to implement in society. Exactly. And that's exactly what this what this nature article suggests is when there are these inaccurate perceptions, you use both to fill in. Mm. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a really good way of putting it. That's brilliant. Jeff, I have a, I have another example. Can I share an example? Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to share my screen here. Let's see if, uh, is it Trudeau? The yeah, it's Trudeau. Pleads with the, unva- pleads with the unvaccinated. Yeah. Well, I think first of all, we do have to recognize that, the vast majority of Canadians have stepped up, have been there uh, to get themselves vaccinated, to protect their loved ones, to protect frontline health workers. Uh, And that is uh, significant. We're amongst the the, the top countries in the world uh, in terms of citizens uh, stepping forward to do the right thing. Let's pause it there for a second. Notice the references to the majority and the social norms of helping others and doing the right thing. So, so he's, he's really, he's really leaning on these descriptive norms in this speech. Mm-hmm. And then he goes on and, uh, he'll talk about, uh, the response of others in society towards those who are unvaccinated. Listen to this. <clears throat> so it's not just about governments, uh, and health workers, uh, frustrated, frustrated. Uh, there are uh, Canadians who still continue uh, to choose to not get vaccinated. It's fellow Canadians as well. When people are seeing uh, cancer treatments uh, and elective surgeries put off uh, because beds are filled with people who chose not to get vaccinated, they're frustrated. When people see that we're in uh, lockdowns or serious public health restrictions right now because um, the risk posed to all of us by unvaccinated people, people get angry. And we have put forward many, many different measures to encourage, to reassure, to incentivize, to educate, to cajole, to remind people that it's never too late to do the right thing. So you notice there, Trudeau was explicit about the government's attempts to nudge and goad, I think he used the word cajole, cajole the population <laughs> yeah, into <laughs> compliance. So, and, and that speech itself was a nudge using Mm. social norms and in fact uh, even expressing how people view those who weren't compliant right other people because you're not following the social norm other people are going to be angry with you they're going to be frustrated with you Mm -hmm. and uh, so that's the other part of the approval of that and that's okay that's understandable yeah Mm -hmm. the prescriptive like that's that's acceptable that's right that is acceptable to be frustrated with those who are non-compliant yeah. Yeah. So there you see the both the carrot and the stick of the social norms, right? The carrot is look at all these wonderful things that people are doing. Everybody's doing this. You should too. And then the stick is if you don't do this, 
the majority will be angry with you. They're going to be frustrated with you. And there's going to be some sort of reprisal, maybe. You know, I don't know. We'll see. See what happens. (laughs) We'll see. (laughs) Yeah. So one of the, that's related to, so so one of the, we'll jump sections for a bit because I think this this article puts it nicely. um, Some of these ideas, how how they're all connected. And it, it uses a phrase of when we're living in communities, so I'll read it from the paper here. So it's a different section, but it, it speaks to the, the use of norms. The behavior of individuals living in communities is regulated by moral norms and moral values. People who do what is right are respected and publicly admired, while those who do what is wrong are devalued and socially excluded. So you do the right thing. You follow the prescribed behaviors. You're a good person. You deviate from that you're a bad person, you get devalued, you get excluded. Mm-hmm. I have an example of that uh, uh, happening in media, Jeff. I don't know if you remember this, but it was Don Lemon or Don Lemon. I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce his name, on CNN when he talks mm-hmm. about shaming the unvaccinated. The people who are not getting vaccines, who are believing the lies on the internet instead of science, it's time to start shaming them. What else? Or leave them behind. Because they are keeping the majority of Americans behind. So he says about the unvaccinated, he says, it's time to shame them or to leave them behind. Okay, so again, it's it's this notion of devaluing, um, mm-hmm. just like you said there, socially devaluing, maybe socially excluding. That's been recommended here on CNN. Mm. Do, you know, do you have the date on that? Let's see. It seems like this came out in September 16, 2021. Okay. Was the article at least about this. So it was when when you already had, you know, vaccines rolling out and I guess there were people who were still refusing vaccination and uh this is now their way of of essentially not just reinforcing that norm but also telling people how to respond to those who are not following the norm. You're supposed to you're supposed to shame them, leave right. them behind, exclude them. And so on. And of course, we have that 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 fantastic quote uh, from Noam Chomsky, mm. right, who basically says, like, exclude these people from society, let them take care of themselves. Mm-hmm. It's really actually sad to see Noam Chomsky uh, respond that way. Uh, but yeah, that's there's a lot of people making that case or who were making that case that you should right. socially exclude those people who weren't following the norm. Yeah, that that's the right thing to do. It's appropriate to do. It only mm-hmm. makes sense to do that. Yeah, from these institutions, from these experts. Speaking of institutions, I don't know if you've heard of, I don't know if you've heard of these guys, Dan, but there's an example from the uh, the World Economic Forum. Have you heard okay. of these guys? Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Poll shows social distancing and masks continue despite COVID vaccination. Mm. So talking about how around the world people are still distancing Still wearing their masks. This is July 2021, um, despite the fact that they're they're vaccinated. So once again, more descriptive normative information, what people are doing with respect to these, you know, pandemic related behaviors. And then this this poll data goes on to show information from around the world about other activities that people are less likely to be doing even even when they're vaccinated. So you're getting the People are doing these good behaviors. Here's the percentage. And then people, maybe these less desirable behaviors. Then you're getting the numbers coming out um, for those where there's lower percentage of people being willing to eat in restaurants, use public transit, go to sports events and concerts, et cetera. So lots of examples throughout this pandemic about the use of these poll articles, pumping out what people are doing. And then you'll see anytime there's a poll that shows people aren't doing the right things you'll see the prescriptive norms bolstered somewhere you know somewhere in the article to make a correction right so Mm -hmm. just like the other article says if people aren't doing the healthy behaviors include the prescriptive norms to correct that to communicate effectively what people should be doing even if they're not doing it can't just Mm -hmm. let the descriptive the unhealthy descriptive norms just sit out there on their own yeah, this is really interesting because the, the the question one might ask is, 
you know, are are the media in on this? Like, how are they? Because they're obviously communicating a lot of these norms. Um, how how are they involved? And it turns out that academics in their papers have also provided guidance to media about how to message social norms. Mm. And I have a paper here by Good. Lunn and colleagues, 2020. And the paper, I think I referred to it in the last episode, is titled Using Behavioral Science to Help Fight the Coronavirus, a Rapid Narrative Review. And in there, they have this section that says media reporting matters too. And they say the following, quote, Faithfully reporting that people are trying to follow advice, assuming that they are, will be as important as highlighting failures to following it, because conditional co-operators need to know that others are cooperating. Where behaviors fall short, a reasonable degree of disapproval is helpful. So again, we see that. There it is. You know, they're actually telling media how to do this. Look, if people... Uh, if people are following it, you want to praise it, you want to tell them what others are doing, that's the same, right? They're all following that norm. But for those people who are falling short, well, they can be chastised a little bit. You can disapprove of their behavior, and that's okay. So it seems like everybody's on board with this. Uh, they were seeing a uniformity here, yeah. Yeah. Now, he, Jeff, there's another element to this that I found really interesting, and and that is that the academics, the researchers, are also recommending that in order to optimally communicate social norms, people should somehow make use of overt symbols. Mm. Overt symbols, okay? And to listen to this, see if you recognize this happening out there in the world. So here's a paper by Wood and Shulman, 2021. It's called Beyond Politics, Promoting COVID-19 Vaccination in the United States. This is the New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of the top journals, okay? And they have a table, table one, with uh, strategies for promoting COVID-19 vaccination. And remember last episode, I mentioned how a lot of these papers have these boxes or tables that summarize all these recommendations. So they have one of these. And uh, they have a section that's titled Increase Observability. Mm. Make it easy to see in person or online who has been vaccinated. So this is with regard to vaccination, right? So you you got to make it somehow visible. Well, how much you do that? They suggest offer a variable token, a bracelet, sticker, or pin that can be observed by others. Offer social media frames and banners. And they give an example, quote, I'm a first responder and I'm vaccinated. And so the whole idea here is to make this overt by 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 using badges and i, I remember mm. people on social media sometimes posting like their vaccine status like i've got my second shot or whatever and i don't know how much of that you saw out there in the world but think about this i mean for academics i think this is kind of a natural progression of things because in the last few years to improve uh you know research practices in the field to get people to adopt the best research practices they started to create these badges, badges th that go yeah. on papers, right? So if, you are, if you're if you going to uh, show all your data to the world on a repository, on a publicly accessible repository, which is a great thing, they give you a badge. Yep. You know, if you pre-registered your study, they give you a badge. So now papers have all these badges, little icons, right, at the top, and, and they indicate how good of a researcher you were or how well you followed the normative research mm -hmm. practices yep right and so so it seems like for them it might be a natural thing just give up badges and it feels like the whole country maybe the world has regressed into this primary school you know <laughs> cub scouts badges where we go around and we like i you know i know how to gold make stars, fire right the gold, gold star. star well th this has gone wrong in certain places <laughs> 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 identifying people who have been vaccinated by gold star might not be a good idea mm -hmm. some kind of almost like as if it's some kind of credit system then you could show your your points. It's it's like a social credit system, maybe a social credit score. Hmm, this is interesting. It's yeah. It's there's some there's some scoring tallying. Yeah, that's involved right. Involved in it, it's public. That's you right. See, yeah, you can see it. Well, see the benefit of it, right? Is that like normally you'd have to go around people to to see whether or not you should associate with them because they're following the proper norms. You have to engage in some conversation with them. You'd have right. to talk to them and so on. And and then you have to remember, and that requires a lot of cognitive load. So instead, mm -hmm. it would be great if these things were just observable yeah. out there. I'm going to say 
it would be so much more convenient. Yeah, that's right. You know, let's use that convenience. That's right. Yeah, because then Wouldn't everybody be would know who's doing the right thing. Yeah. And then Wouldn't that way you could only time. associate with people who are doing the right thing. Yeah. yeah I mean, I'm just so thinking much, out loud here. Yeah, that would be, I, I think convenience would be, would be the way to go. Yeah. Who doesn't like convenience, right? Yeah. Well, there, there, there's another paper here I, I just have in but my see, pile here. <laughs> yeah, go on. With badges, you can maybe lose your badge or your sticker can fall off. Yeah. That's not very convenient. You got to go, no. go print another one, go back and get another one. What if there's something more permanent? Well, why don't we just attach? put it on people's phones? Put it on people's phones because they carry yeah. their phone around everywhere. And that way, if you, you can just, you know, somehow communicate what if you with lose your phone? phone. Well, just get a tattoo then. Yeah. You got to have some, something. Per yeah, yeah. I think that makes, that's convenient. I think we're onto something here. I think so. I think Klaus Schwab is listening. He's excited about what we're saying right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more paper on this. This is Chevalier and colleagues, 2021, COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy shortening the last mile. And this is in Trends in Cognitive Sciences. So another major paper, another major journal. And they have a, a, a subsection that says, leverage the power of social norms. Mm -hmm. Okay. I like how they and use they the word leverage. I thought that was leverage. a manipulation check term, but they're, they're using that. They're using that exactly, yeah. Leverage the power of social norms. Quote, because individuals learn about social norms in part by observing others, helping early adopters of the COVID-19 vaccine display their pro-vaccination choice or intention, for example, by providing easy access to badges or ribbons might have easy. a it's positive... Be convenient. Yeah, might have a positive influence on the decisions of others, end mm. quote. And they go on to cite prior research, which shows that giving uh, badges to vaccinated healthcare workers, badges, for instance, they quoted here, I'm vaccinated against influenza to protect you. They apparently increase vaccination rates. And mm -hmm. so there's some prior work on this. Uh, and again, badges and so on. So I think this is going to become popular in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. Absolutely. Yeah. Who doesn't love badges? Yeah. Now, the question I have for you, Jeff, is does this actually work? Do you think this norm, this uh, norm dropping uh, in the media and uh, do you, yeah, do, do you think it's effective? You know what? That's a great question. I think it does. Um, at the same time, I don't... <sighs> Do you, do you, so I'll ask you, I'll ask, I'll answer that question with a question. Dan, yeah. before you decide on what to do, do you look around to see what other people are doing? Um, I suspect that I'm, might be, uh, in the minority, uh, because I typically tend to just plow forward and then I look around and I'm like, why isn't anybody with me? <laughs> <laughs> why is everybody wearing these badges? <laughs> why is everybody wearing badges? <laughs> Yeah, and I, I have a tendency that I think I'm the same way where I'll see the like I'll see these stories or I'll see these they always stick out to me like a sore thumb. Yeah. So I can't speak for others, but I have a tendency to think, you know, I think the, the science here is pretty is pretty robust. And I think experientially you could see it. Um, but it's interesting. I don't think it captures I don't think it captures everybody. Um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've got a few you'll see papers it too, like actually. It, what's that? Go on. Go on. Go ahead. I'll so say you'll see it in all kinds of things like fads or trends. Yes. Um, that the, the latest, everybody's got to do the latest thing or, or the hairstyle or the, the fashion or, or, or anything like that. So you'll see it, mm -hmm. you'll see the power of it experientially yeah. in, in your life. And then when it gets leveraged intentionally, then I think you could also start to see it where you'll see these downstream effects of like, wow, everybody starts doing this. And then one person starts to do it and then everybody starts doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there there are these there are these uh, prior findings that show that leveraging norms is somewhat effective in some contexts. Oh, okay. Yeah, one example is a uh, is a paper by Hallsworth. It's a 2016 paper, so it's pre-pandemic. It's in the Lancet, and it's titled uh, "Provision of Social Norm Feedback to High Prescribers of Antibiotics in General Practice: A Pragmatic 
National Randomized Control Trial. And this is one of the studies demonstrating the effectiveness of Nudge. And basically what they did is conduct a natural experiment, large group of medical doctors in England, and they targeted those who were in the top 20% of their peers in terms of prescribing antibiotics. And the whole idea is you want to reduce antibiotic prescription because you want to you know, reduce the likelihood that you're going to get some antibiotic resistant bacteria. And so they did a natural experiment and they divided those doctors into two groups. And one group received a message that just told them that they were in the top 20% of their peers in terms of antibiotic prescription. And so that's the social norm communication. The other group didn't get any kind of communication like that. And uh, let me just find their conclusion here. So they say, quote, our results show that providing a low cost male based intervention incorporating social norm feedback on high antibiotic use can consistently reduce such use over a six month period. So it did have an effect. And I'm just trying to remember off the top of my head, it was only a few percent. Okay. But, but when you look at the number of doctors and the number of antibiotics, it was like a, a large number of antibiotics. So small effects. Remember, this is a point that you made, I think, in a previous episode, right? You could have a small effect, but when you extrapolate that over the all the, the, the entire population, or in this case, the population of doctors and the population of antibiotics prescribed, it's actually a quite a sizable effect. Mm -hmm. And and mm -hmm. and so they argued that that was effective. But the problem in that study is they also had a few other nudge manipulations that they that they put in there. And I did look just before our episode at some papers that specifically looked at nudging social norms uh, in the context of COVID-19 uh, vaccination. One paper examined this in young people, and here's what they say. These findings suggest that the practical usefulness of signaling descriptive norms is rather limited. Okay? Interesting. Yeah, so it, they, they said it wasn't a very big effect. They would tell people, for example, among people in general, 85% plan to be vaccinated, or in another group, 45% plan to be vaccinated. So they're communicating social norms. And overall, it didn't seem to have that much of an mm. impact. And then there's this other paper here. So in that was economics. coming in just to ask. So like a, a, that was sort of a naturalistic manipulation of sorts where it was they're coming into a school or community and introducing these norms in an, in yeah, an it's, already it's, existing landscape of COVID. Yeah, it's an already existing landscape of COVID. And they're saying, uh, so this was... Um, Participants were 18 to 30 year olds residing in the UK. And they were just given this message and then asked about their intentions to vaccinate. So this is already okay. in the context of, of, of COVID. But uh, they argue, obviously, it's a small effect. Then there's another paper here uh, titled The Importance of Social Norms Against Strategic Effects. The Case of COVID-19 Vaccine Uptake. And this is an economics letters. And what they did was ask people about their vaccine intentions, and they also asked them about their beliefs about the intentions of others to be vaccinated. And what they find is a strong correlation between your intention to vaccinate and your belief that other people will get vaccinated. So there the idea is, hey, maybe the norms do matter, but it's a correlational design with your judgment about what others are going to do. So it's not quite the same as receiving the manipulation of a particular kind of messaging. Mm -hmm. uh, so as you can see, like the, the evidence might be mixed, but there, there seems to, you know, it, it does seem to be the case that there might be some small effects about, you know, with the use of these norms. Uh, but certainly when you extrapolate those across the large number of people in the population, you can imagine small effects can translate into sizable impacts. Yeah. And there's, there may be a bit of a effect size issue with respect to the manipulations in those individual studies versus full onslaught media politicians institutions coming in with the same manipulation yes. versus a researcher coming in with a paragraph saying here read this about what your what your peers do now report on this the the strength i, I guess the, the strength of the manipulation um is probably um something to be considered as well Mm -hmm. when considering mm -hmm. the um the effectiveness of norms that's an excellent point yeah so jeff let's move on to this this uh recommendation in the van bavel paper to uh employ 
trusted authorities as being the vehicle for the messaging. Tell us about that a little bit. So one of the things they talk about is the use of social networks mm. to amplify this. This actually might speak well to what we're just talking about to amplify the spread of behaviors that are both harmful and beneficial during an epidemic. And these effects may spread through the network of friends, friends, and even friends, friends, friends. Mm, I think I got mm -hmm. all those friends right. So you can sort of seed these desirable behaviors and messages about undesirable behaviors into these social networks. And then that has carry on effects downstream, right? So I guess to bring it back to some of these study ideas, if you're going to do a manipulation or actually how that an effect size could sort of roll out in the, um, in the population where you can come in, you could do a manipulation. Maybe the effect on that individual is small, but let's say there's a behavioral change there. That behavioral change in that individual may have these contagion effects of that individual's friends, mm -hmm. which could change their behavior and then ultimately change those people's behavior. You can change maybe their friends behavior. So that's where you get these friends, 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 and you can get this. So you get the spread, perhaps viral spread of this desirable behavior through this contagion effect. So the, the paper goes on to say, some research suggests that a larger proportion of interventions can come not from direct effects on people who receive the intervention, but from indirect effects on their social context who copied the behavior. So that's where this sort of domino effect of these, 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 these desirable behaviors spreading throughout a population mm -hmm. through this sort of seed, I'll call it like a seeding idea. And then it goes on to say, we may therefore leverage the impact of any behavioral change effort by targeting well-connected individuals and making their behavioral change visible and salient to others. So influencers and, and, and influential people. Leaders. Yeah. In these networks, they're highly visible, salient to others, change their behavior. That's going to have bigger cascading effects than just say, if Dan or I, let's say we were to change our behaviors, mm -hmm. how much of a cascade is that going to have, right? Yeah. And what you could see is if we pull up some examples here of the use of celebrities to promote these uh, desirable behaviors. And then at the same time, you're um, discouraging the undesirable behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's pull up some examples here. So there's many of these. It doesn't take much research to start pulling up some of these examples. Um, and here we go here. So Biden administration to use celebrities, athletes, and campaign to combat COVID vaccine hesitancy. Mm -hmm. uh, Biden and Obama urge Americans to get vaccinated in star-studded television special. And then here we have the promotion of a celebrity. Jennifer Aniston and other celebrities endorse vaccines. Experts say their pleas may not help. And then from there, we have this idea of social influencers. Yes. Where these uh, highly, um, highly followed and influential people in, in social media. So the, the explicit use and leveraging of these, um, of these influencers here. We can see multiple examples of that as well. So intentional um use of and publicized use of we're going to use these people we're going to do this and we're going to promote these we're going to promote this thing we're going to promote this behavior yeah and uh, i have other examples here too so there's a video uh it's on youtube by good morning america and it's titled here's every public figure who has gotten a covid19 vaccine so far and it's it's a three minute video and it just shows you all the different celebrities on on film, actually, many of them getting their vaccine. And so you have, you know, a lot of people that you would know from basketball stars like like Bill Russell, who says something like, this is a shot that I'm not going to block <laughs> or something like that. Right? Uh, but you've got everybody, you know, the presidents on there and so on. So, yeah, they're really trying to demonstrate visible. And yeah. And so I, and, and again, just referring back to the to the literature and, and showing that Van Bavel and colleagues weren't the only ones suggesting this, I can go back to that Volp and Lowenstein and Budenheim paper. This was the JAMA paper, and they have a section titled Use Public Endorsements from Trusted Leaders to Increase Uptake. Okay, and so, again, this is very clearly explicit 
Quote, once initial high priority groups like healthcare workers received a vaccine, states and cities could preferentially allocate the vaccine to employers contingent on leadership publicly vaccinating as an example for employees, end quote. And they use this concept, credibility enhancing display. Ooh. <laughs> and I guess that's something that's used maybe in, in the business realm where the leaders... Is that a CED you're talking about? <laughs> that, CED, that's right. Uh, yeah, where, where, where leaders model behavior uh, and then the, ar the argument is that employees or, or followers, you know, will enact the same behavior. And then they say, engaging in a recommended behavior is far more effective in convincing others than simply recommending that behavior. It may also be useful for trusted national leaders representing diverse demographic groups and political parties to get publicly vaccinated. And so we saw that, right? We saw Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in that very awkward that that nurse who kind of like it was as she was like throwing a dart or something tried to you know aim and get it into his arm it, it distance, clearly was set up so that everybody distance. could see it yeah physical distance but it was clearly set up so that everybody could see it right because yeah. that was the point really is is the yes. demonstration so even this what's interesting too is this one of these articles here from the use of influencers so this forbes article the article actually says this is from the article you can scold, cajole, to the use of the word again, and pressure people to make them do things they don't want to do. This approach mostly backfires as folks don't like being ordered around. Sometimes spending a little money or seeing a young person dancing helps change opinions. And it goes on later. It seems that politicians and business leaders have started to realize that chastising and villainizing Americans isn't a very effective playbook for a large proportion of the population. So using the <laughs> playbook in control. <laughs> they're now oh, finally right. starting to figure out that maybe money talks. So they're trying to they're just say, okay, so what what do we what do we do now? We let's just let's, let's try this other strategy that may that may work better to try and increase, you know, to try <laughs> increase yeah. the uptake of these desirable behaviors right out there in the open, right? There's not hide like, there's no hiding what's going on. We're trying to manipulate people. We're trying to control people. Yeah, and it's like, to we've got a playbook. We've got a playbook. There's <laughs> lots of different plays here. And yeah. we're, we're talking just right now about the about the nudge level plays, right? So we're yes. not we're not talking about the actual coercion and all that kind of stuff yet. That's right. like the next, that's like full paternalism. Yes. Uh, but right now, just this is sort, sort of stuff. And again, I could just read papers here all day long, Jeff, about recommending this. Okay, so just yeah. another one. Wood and Shulman, 2021, New England Journal of Medicine, right? Quote, partner with celebrities, respected local leaders, and members of all parties to show them on old and new media being vaccinated. So you have to demonstrate to be vaccinated. And, and here's another one. This is from a paper by Daru and colleagues in the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA. Quote, public health campaigns should enlist, this is very important, should enlist cultural leaders outside of traditional medical and public health communities as vaccination champions. Mm. Cultural leaders should be made partners to develop and spread culturally relevant messaging and ensure educational content is shared via readily accessible venues and formats. And I have some examples of this. And notice here, the, the way this is kind of very particularly targeting those outside of your standard medical and public health communities and maybe even presidents and so on. It's about community leaders. And so, for instance, UNICEF here has a press release on May 2021 that says, Zimbabwe's religious leaders increase efforts to tackle COVID-19 and support vaccines. It says, faith leaders are critical partners in addressing many known barriers to the uptake of health and other essential services, including vaccines. So they're targeting the the religious leaders. And I remember hearing Bill Gates, I think this was an, on an interview uh, on, on a podcast or on a show, and he is asked about how to, you know, increase uptake of, of some of these vaccines. And his response is, well, you got to enlist, and, and I think the word he used is a trust hierarchy. People in the trust hierarchy, yes. he talks about, how they did that in the case of polio and you know they would actually get religious leaders to vaccinate their children in front of 
their followers, and that was going to increase increase vaccine uptake. And there are many examples of this. The one I stumbled across also is from the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. And they have a, a whole website on this, COVID-19 Guide for Governments, Working with Religious Leaders to Support Public Health Measures. And man, it's like they really give you some detailed play-by-play -play stuff. They talk about uh, governments should build trust with faith-based organizations. They call them FBOs. FBOs. And integrate them into planning. And it says this. This is like, listen to this. Religious leaders can lend their reputation and communications reach to governments to support behavior change and compliance with social distancing and other mitigation measures. So they, they want to leverage the reputation and the communication reach. And then later on, they also talk about how they can then tell them about how to dispel misinformation within their own community. So they become champions for the government message. And then whatever the government deems as being misinformation, they tell that to these religious leaders and the religious leaders will make sure they root out that misinformation right. from they their flock. Rebuttals, address it directly. Yeah, that's right. That's so I, I think the, the insight I had from this was just how nuanced and targeted and particular these approaches were. It's not like they're just throwing some, you know, grenade out there. It's going to explode. Oh, these are like <laughs> sniper fire uh, mm. strategies that are meant to target certain leaders and certain religious communities, you know, and then, you know, you, you get them to become the ambassadors yes. of the message and then also defenders of the message and rooters out of what is officially considered to be misinformation. Mm. That's power. I love that. I love that analogy you gave of the grenade versus the sniper. Mm. That's so that's, that's fantastic. And then what you have to with the individuals within these like influential, these, this sniper approach where you get these targeted individuals like faith-based, what you're getting then as well. And it speaks to your other comment about how you're, when you're doing these norm interventions, you may be leveraging other manipulations as well is now you're dealing with a very specific in-group. And now you got the leader of the in-group telling people this. And if you're going to go against that now, now you're going to be out of the group. You're shamed you're, and you're, you're also out. removed. Yeah. yeah. That's a powerful... Yeah. So you're ca you get this cascading manipulations with this targeted approach via these leaders, via these influential people in these tighter-knit communities, in these tighter-knit groups. You're not one of us anymore. Yeah. If you're deviating, right? You're going to be schismatic, right? Yeah. And to reiterate your earlier quote of the Van Bavel paper, they suggest that directly. Remember, they talked about uh, those who, who are doing something wrong. They're the devalued right, exactly. and socially excluded. And, yeah. and there's, a, there's a very interesting thing in the Van Bavel paper, too. I just want to get this out there before we, we finish off this episode. Is, and, and see if you agree with me. It's in the way that it's written. Because it's written kind of descriptively, right? Like, um, you know, this is what happens in social situations. People who don't follow the social norm are mm -hmm. devalued and socially excluded. They don't, right. they don't, we have to be careful, right? Because they don't actually go out and say, go and devalue and socially exclude other people. They don't quite say that, but it is kind of just described as this is what will unfold if you implement these social mm -hmm. norms. And the implication, maybe the subtle between the lines is that's all good stuff. Right, right. Yeah, that this is not a bad it's not a bad yeah, thing. it's not a bad outcome yeah yeah when you're going you're going for desirable ends yeah we need to do these that's that's kind of the, the ends will justify the means in 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 a sense right yeah so do you want to talk about the leaders should we get into the leaders yes tell us about the leaders and particularly the leaders who misbehave jeff <laughs> so dan you already talked about the the influence of the leaders with respect to creating these norms and being highly visible for these mm -hmm. norms. One of the things the Van Bavel paper talks about is using leaders to leverage another mechanism that we've talked about a little bit, but to draw it out more explicitly, this sh shared social identity. So this paper recommends a priority for leaders is to create a sense of shared social identity amongst followers. So we're going to change the frame, change the lens. You're part of this group. We're all in this together. Remember that? 
A large body of research suggests that people tend to prefer leaders who cultivate a sense that, quote, we are all in this together. So mm. not only is that desirable for the ends, but then leaders are more liked or the more preferred that do those kinds of, that do those kinds of things. So it goes on to say leaders who are seen as prototypical for the group, quote, one of us and acting for the interest of the group as a whole, working for us rather than for themselves or for another group tend to gain greater influence. So you can leverage, we're all in this together. You get more influential, you get more preference. Actions that divide the leader from the followers or suggest that the leader is not prepared to share the burdens of the followers can be corrosive to their ability to shape followers' behavior. For instance, leaders who threaten with sanctions as a way to deter undesirable behavior may make people feel distrusted and paradoxically reduce their willingness to do as they're told. Mm. Oops. <laughs> mm-hmm. So if you want to so- bring people in... <laughs> Yeah. You may not want to threaten use sanctions because what's, what is that going to do? That's going to drive people further away, right? It's not going to be a very compelling mm-hmm. lever to try and bring people back in. Mm-hmm. All right. So building a strong sense of shared identity can help coordinate efforts to manage threats, foster in-group commitment and adherence to norms. Goes on. Leaders can do this, for instance, by being a source of moral elevation. Visibly displaying pro-social selfless acts can promote observers to also act with kindness, generosity themselves. In this way, leaders can function as role models, motivate people to put their own values into action. Having respected politicians, celebrities, community community leaders, model exemplary behaviors and sacrifice could promote social behavior and cooperation. So we're going to get the the modeling of, we don't only get the modeling of the norms, but we get the modeling of the desirable behaviors that will then promote those behaviors as part of this social identity. If you want to be part of this group, we're all in this together. We're going to do as the leader does. And that sounds really great, right? To get people to do, do these things. And we're seeing if we're, if we're to give a, a scorecard, Dan, of how these manipulations have worked so far, if we start with, let's say the norms with mm-hmm. the fear you know, what would you, what would you grade those? Well, I think uh, they did a great okay. job on those. I mean, they overdid the fear, as we mentioned. They kind <laughs> right, of yeah. messed that up a little bit. The norms, yeah. they communicated very well, I think, throughout the whole thing. That yes. They get an A plus on norms. I'm gonna, yeah, a, I agree with A plus on norms. Maybe but, A plus but, plus even. Yeah. Uh, and I would, I would get a, they would get a good grade in recruiting, I think, cultural leaders yeah. to, to promote their message to their constituents. But I, I think when it comes to actually the the leaders themselves demonstrating the appropriate behavior, they get like an F. Because <laughs> and the only thing that okay, no, let's let's give them a D. A D, okay. Because 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 they did stand up there in front of everybody and and take the shot, right? So there are they are on video. Remember Biden was on a stage and got the shot, and so they're they're that that's public record. With in, in terms of some of the other measures, they seem to at times falter. And yes. uh, so it was like a good performance and then bloop, suddenly they kind of fell off the balance beam and it was a big wipeout. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we have a few examples of those. Okay. Here's a couple from the UK. Um, mm-hmm. More recently, we have Boris Johnson with the, with the lockdown parties. So everybody Ooh, should be yes. social distancing, staying at home. But we're gonna, yep. we're gonna, we're gonna yuck it up at these at these parties, and then when yep. that you know comes out, oops, not that doesn't look so good, right? So that doesn't bode well for the sense of a shared identity. We're all in this together. Well, we're yes. all in this together, and you're, <laughs> yeah, you're having a party. Yeah, it's like they don't really believe like, maybe exactly everything that they're saying. They're like, oh, I kind of believe it, but if I want to have some fun, it's like I'm not gonna put a mask <laughs> on or social distance. Come on. That's that's for the that's for the the unwashed masses. There you go. And so here's some examples. Now that you mentioned it, here's some examples from that where we have of late somewhat topical the Super Bowl that got some publicity with all these uh, oh yeah celebrities and athletes. Here we go. Where where were the masks? Celebrities and fans enjoy Super Bowl maskless despite mandate. So there's a mandate mask mandate. All these people in these in this arena. Nobody's social distancing. Nobody's wearing masks. 
Um, and then prior to that, we even have um, an uh, article here on Obama's, I think it was his birthday party, private jets, no masks, how the Obama's party was height of elite hypocrisy. So there's no, no shortage of these examples of, we'll call them leaders, politicians, celebrities, mm-hmm. not following, not setting that example, not having that moral elevation. Of, of uh, more recently, 2022, March 29th here, um, from the National Post, maskless Ontario liberal rally, a reminder our pol- political parties aren't as different as they want us to think. So we yep. got these political parties having these events where nobody's saying, nobody's following the rules that they're saying we should all still be following. And there so was also in, Al- in Alberta, right? What, what Wasn't the premier of Alberta or his, or some parts of his cabinet uh, caught at some dinner when it was supposed to be locked down. Um, so I have to, maybe I can find that. Yeah, yeah. there's um, tons of these. So another yeah. classic, these are some classics um, here, collectibles. Um, Neil Ferguson. Neil Ferguson, quitting, yes. <laughs> yes. Getting caught in his, uh, in his, uh, what was he doing? He wasn't uh, social distancing. He wasn't locking down. No, his, uh, he was. Recommendations. Yeah, across town with, across with some, town. Other la- <laughs> across town, some other lady. Um, yeah, and just for our listeners and viewers, he was the main modeler behind uh, the Imperial College London model that uh, told us that uh, many millions of people are going to die in the U.S. alone, uh, and that this was going to be a very terrible pandemic. And I think those numbers were meant to be like within a single year, and yes. so so that that turned out to be. Uh, again, incorrect. So there are some models there that overshot, let's just yeah. say, slightly. And based on this, you might argue that I don't know if he believed his own models either, if you see the behavior. Well, this is it, right? Exactly. So the question I have is, do these guys, like maybe it's just a momentary lapse where they forget that they're in a pandemic. <laughs> oh, I knew I was forgetting something. I, was, I, just, I forgot I was in a pandemic. <sighs> I mean, it happens sometimes. Like I'm just... I'm, no way's perfect. My, yeah. Here's one. Um, this here. is a this is a kind of a one too. So this this is what we have here. The next one is this is um uh Hancock. What's his first name? I forget. Matt. Matt Hancock. Oh yeah. Hancock, he was the yeah. Secretary of Health. Is that the health secretary? Yes. And yes. here he is commenting on Neil Ferguson's scandal. And he's yeah. just he's speechless. Oh, it's it's he's, awful. He doesn't have words. He can't even, he doesn't understand it. This is June, 2021. Mm-hmm. And then flash forward, he's quitting his job <laughs> as because, uh, health secretary because he was violating the requirements as well. Yeah. In so some similar way, maybe to the way that Ferguson, guidelines. yeah, yeah in, in, similar, in this very similar way. Cross town, as we say, it's kind of stuff going check. on. Yeah. yeah. Um, so many examples, many, many cases of these Celeb- celebrities, politicians, leaders, not setting, not setting the moral example. And here's the important part. When, when that comes into public view, notice then that other politicians and media denounce them right away. Right. And they have to do that because they have to continue to, to promote the social norm and this idea that the trusted leaders mm-hmm. are following, are, are, are leading by example. Right. So yeah. if you get the ones that falter and don't lead by example, well, they've got to be somehow punished. And that's why some of them have to leave their positions or resign. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, unless you're one of the other top guys, in which case it just kind of, it's like water rolling off a duck's back. It just, it's fine in the end. Or but, what seems what happened with Boris, do we talk about Boris Johnson? Yeah. We talk about the parties, lockdown parties. Yeah. Or the tactic there is it's over. Yeah, that's right. The pandemic's done. What are you talking about? We're done. Yeah, COVID's <laughs> over. That's right. Yeah. You got so your four a, shots. You, you've been distancing for two years. Yeah. It's going to well, be fine. Parties, yeah, yeah, but it's over now, so we can move on. Yeah. <laughs> if you're in the position that, where you could make that call, then you could you could remain in power, you could maybe move on, get past the scandal. So maybe this is a great, great uh, moment to, to, to finish the show here. Yeah. Uh, we've got some more things to talk about with regard to the Van Bavel paper and some of the other techniques that they discuss there. Um, and then maybe we can also, at some point, critique the whole nudge approach. Yeah, that's a great idea. So lots, lots more to talk about. 
All right. Well, I'll talk to you later, Jeff. All right. Thanks, Dan.